All right, thank, thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning, and I'm really excited to uh, hear uh, what uh, my panelists are, are going to be speaking about today. And the reason I'm interested in it uh, is I've spent much of my academic career researching the relationship between intellectual property rights and the way that innovation is organized and the type of innovation projects uh, that investors to select, uh, select to invest in. And in a book that I recently published, I looked at over 100 years of data from US technology history to look at that relationship. And what you find is that contrary to the standard incentive thesis for intellectual property, when intellectual property rights and patent rights are weak, it's not true that innovation collapses. But it is true that the innovation economy is distorted. What we do know is that when IP rights are weak, we don't see a lot of entrepreneurship. Innovation tends to take place within larger corporations that are often reliant on government funding. My research concluded roughly around the mid-2000s, and that's exactly where this panel is going to pick up. And I'm really excited to hear from two academics, Professor David Taylor from SMU Dedman School of Law, Professor Mark Schultz from the University of Akron School of Law, who have conducted studies to see how the experiment that has been running since roughly the mid-2000s, where virtually every branch of the federal government has taken virtually every step possible to weaken the patent system, how does the innovation economy respond? For, for a, as a matter of academic interest, this is very interesting. But for the entrepreneurs and the investors who are out there in the market, it may not be so interesting. And on that point, we're going to hear from Sri Gade from Blue Tree Capital based in Pittsburgh and Gary Lauder, venture capitalist based in Silicon Valley, who are going to tell us uh, on the ground, how is the economy, how is the innovation economy reacting to an environment in which patents are difficult to enforce? And without further ado, I'll invite Professor David Taylor um, to present his research. All right, it's great to be here, and thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I did a survey of investors, venture capital and private equity investors, to see how their investment decisions and their firm's investment decisions have changed, if at all, uh, after the Supreme Court's four most recent patent eligibility decisions. And so I conducted this survey because I wanted to, to answer the question, at least through this survey, um, in terms of their reported behavior changes, did these, cha did these Supreme Court decisions change their firm's investment decisions, and if so, how? And so I've got a lot of data here. I'm going to go fairly quickly. I'm going to try to take about 10 minutes um, to do this. But uh, sent out the firm electronically, also followed up with some uh, phone calls, ended up getting 422 uh, investment firms that responded. There were 474 investors that responded. And you can see the response rates there. Um, you'd always want a better response rate, but th there I am. That's my response rate. Um, so I'm going to present all the data based on investors and their responses. OK. So one of the things I, I was interested in was uh, maybe asking a little bit different questions if the investors knew about any of the four Supreme Court decisions on patent eligibility. So um, I asked if they knew about any of the, the four cases. If they did, I decided to call them eligibility knowledgeable. Uh, if they didn't, I would call them eligibility unknowledgeable. That, you know, it's my characterization, but at least in terms of these cases. I think it's interesting uh, that the 38% of the respondents actually knew about one of these four cases. Uh, and then, you know, we, we had investors of various types, different stages of investment, and the totals equal more than 100% because many investors invest in different uh, companies and different um, startup companies in different stages that they're in. Um, and then as well, uh, these numbers also add up to more than 100% because most investment firms invest in more than one industry, no shock there. But I thought it was interesting that software and the internet was up there at the top at 70% on down to construction, um, still fairly robust at 42%. But these are the different categories uh, of investment industries. And this was actually uh, reported uh, by the firm that collected the data um, this wasn't reported through my survey. This was through, through the firm that collected the contact information for the investors. So I'm going to get to uh, their responses to the survey. 
But uh, I had, I'm going to collect my and present my data here today in terms of my conclusions analyzing the data. The first, uh, I don't think you'll find surprise, but patent eligibility is an important consideration for investors. It's not going to be the most important thing they consider. We'll see that in a second. But uh, if you combine strongly agree with somewhat agree with this statement, you're going to see it's 74%. So 74% of the respondents thought uh, patent eligibility strongly agreed or somewhat agreed that patent eligibility is an important consideration when their firms decide whether to invest in companies developing technology. But then I parsed that out further in terms of the different industries these investors uh, in, invest in. And so those numbers, the strongly agree and somewhat agree, if you add those up, um, I would encourage you here on this screen to look at the very top three, medical devices, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical, um, kind of top the list. And if you skip down to the bottom, you're going to see software and the internet. That said, software and the internet is still at 72%. So 72% of those investors that invest in software and the internet still either strongly or somewhat agree that patent eligibility is an important decision when their firms invest in these companies. So still robust. Um, and interesting, there was a statistically significant difference between these knowledge, uh, knowledgeable investors, eligibility knowledgeable investors, and unknowledgeable. Now I've kind of presented the data in a different way. But five would be strongly agree, four would be somewhat agree. And so um, eligibility knowledgeable investors actually reported uh, different reactions to these cases uh, and more strongly indicated uh, that that impacted their firm's investment decisions. Okay, so uh, that said, I said I'd come back to this. Patent eligibility, I'm not making a claim that patent eligibility is the most important factor in investment decisions. It was not, based on the survey. One interesting thing, so you skip down, you'll see availability of US patents right there uh, on a one to nine scale, because that's the number of things they were ranking. Uh, but availability of US patents there. Uh, the fourth, uh, the most important is quality of the people running the firms that they were looking at investing in. Um, but you'll notice it's actually above first mover advantage, and, and that's actually different from some pr a difference from compared to some prior studies. <clears throat> All right, second principle finding. Uh, uh, reduced patent eligibility correlates with particular investment behaviors in particular industries. Okay? So let me highlight, though, on average, investors report that each industry would see reduced investment if patents were eliminated or less available. Every industry, each industry. Okay, that said, uh, investors in particular industries, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical, uh, indicated there'd be more devastating effect. And I can show this data in a couple of ways. Uh, let me just show it to you. Um, so one is on this one to five scale, uh, with, with five being a, a you know, I strongly agree with the statement that I presented. Uh, but you'll notice here that the, the lowest is construction and transportation. I'm going to highlight software and the internet there. Skip down to the bottom, medical devices, biotechnology, pharmaceutical. The life sciences industries is what I'll call those. Um, and actually, I think I had it switched. But anyways, the, the one, yeah, uh, one indicating, uh, let me go back to the previous slide. Yeah, significantly increase investments being at five and sig significantly decrease investments being at one. So significantly decrease investments, the life sciences were, uh, re the investors were reporting uh, decreased investments in those industries. Um, notice every uh, mean that was below three. And so they're all on the decrease investment side of the survey. Uh, another way to look at this is to actually parse out and show you uh, the particular data for the different industries. Again, look down at the bottom, medical devices, biotechnology, pharmaceutical, strongly decreased investments, um, 42 up to 56% of the respondents agree that they would strongly, their firms would strongly decrease investments in those areas. Uh, I want to highlight software and the internet. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but uh, software and the internet, 53% uh, no impact. But actually, that's interesting. But if you look on either side of the 53%, notice that decrease has uh, uh, greater percentages there. So still in software and the internet, the investors were reporting uh, more often compared to increasing investment that they would decrease investment. OK. So a third principle finding, um, I'm going fairly quickly, but I've got about 10 minutes. Third principle finding is that the, the cases have uh, impacted firms' existing investments, but more significantly, I think, going forward, their investment behaviors. Um, and in particular, uh, the investors with, knowledgeable, with knowledge of these cases 
reported that the cases have impacted their firm's investment decisions. And I tried to tease out what did that mean by asking the questions, did you increase investments, decrease investments, but also did you shift investments between industries? And they reported that as well. And kind of a running theme here is the most significantly affected industries were pharmaceutical, medical device, and biotechnology, the life sciences industries. Okay, so um, I asked uh, 1%, I actually reported that the Supreme Court's eligibility cases have actually been a very positive, have had a very positive impact on their existing investments, um, but uh, somewhat negative and very negative, those totaled 40% collectively. Um, and then, uh, have any of these cases affect your decisions whether to invest? 33% actually said yes. Noticeably, 61% said no, um, but 33% said yes. Okay. So then I asked, uh, okay, if you know about these cases and if you report that these cases have impacted your firm's investment decisions, which of these cases? And so, uh, interestingly enough, the Myriad case was the highest, 38%. A little bit of a surprise to me. I think I would have thought Mayo would have uh, ranked higher, but Mayo there was second. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I asked them, okay, how did they impact your decision, or how did these, how did the one or more of these cases impact your decision? And you'll notice decreased investments overall was 49%, uh, but shifting investments be between industries was, was also pretty um, high at 34%. And some people said they increased investments as a result of these cases. So really, you would want to net, I think, those against each other just to look at an overall impact. Um, okay, so then we can break this down in terms of industries. So there's the running theme, pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical devices. Uh, this is uh, in knowledgeable investors, so they knew about at least one of the Supreme Court cases. Um, if they reported they shifted investments, I asked, okay, which, in which industries did you shift investments out of? And they reported the life sciences most significantly. But notice that right below that is software and the internet. So these knowledgeable investors reported that they were uh, shifting investments out of software and the internet. 21% of them reported that. Then I asked, okay, well, what are you shifting investments into? What industries are you shifting investment into? Um, uh, so uh, kind of a mixed bag here in my mind at least, but computer electronic hardware, 16% on down to transportation. No one reported they were shifting investments into transportation as a result of these cases. And then, uh, interestingly enough, some people said they were increasing or shifting investments into some of the life sciences, but at a pretty low rate, 6% response rate on that. Software and the internet, though, at 13%. All right, so uh, the fourth principle finding that, that investors with knowledge of the Supreme Court's eligibility cases actually indicated different responses compared to investors without this knowledge. So the knowledgeable investors reported different responses to the cases, okay? So this is the unknowledgeable, again, just in the sense that they didn't uh, report they knew about one of these four Supreme Court cases. Um, these are in, uh, areas of investment they shifted out of, away from, okay? Software and the internet is actually lower on the list there at 7%. Let me just highlight here, I think what's really interesting though, these unknowledgeable investors shifted investment into the software and internet industry, 32% reported that. So the, the respondents who did not know about these, any of these Supreme Court cases more often were shifting investments into soft, uh, the software and internet industry uh, during the relevant time period. Okay, so in, in short, uh, this is, it's a survey, it's responses, um, this is what they're reporting. Uh, but over this time period of the Supreme Court's eligibility cases, knowledgeable investors more often reduced investment in software and the internet as compared to the eligibility unknowledgeable investors who more often increased investment in that um, industry. All right. So I think the, you know, the overall, uh, this is an important, I think it's an important survey. So I'm a little biased, it's my own survey, but I think it's helpful to have data when we're analyzing uh, whether we ought to um, go to Congress and ask for changes to the statute with respect to patent eligibility. It's better to have um, evidence, data-backed evidence, rather than, uh, and anecdotal stories are important, actually, as part of that story, but having surveys or other um, studies that collect data, I think, is gonna be more persuasive. And I think uh, my, I don't have it on the slide, but my overall reaction is, at least, at least for the life sciences industries, there's a significant negative impact on private equity um, and venture capital investment as a result of the Supreme Court's eligibility cases. So I'll stop there. 
Thank you, David. That, that was great. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to call Mark up, but just a quick observation. Uh, that's while the evidence is still preliminary, still developing, it takes time for there's a time lag in market responses to changes in the law. Um, that's consistent with, with the research that I and others have done over longer periods. The, the market reacts, the market can adapt to low IP environments, but the market's distorted. Uh, and I think um, the findings, while, while still preliminary, uh, David's findings are important because they show clear uh, diversion of investment away from an area that's not only economically important, but it's important as, as a matter of public health. So thank you, David. Now I'll turn the mic over to Mark. Thank you. So I, I know that there's, there are some economists in the audience, and, and the very typical economist response to David's survey would be, that's what people say they're doing or thinking, but show me their revealed preferences. So my study is complementary to David's in, in that regard, and in fact occurred after David's. Uh, so this is a study that looks at uh, shifts in the uh, how have how has the venture, venture capital investment shifted during the time period uh, patent the U.S. patent system has been weakened, and of course it's motivated. Uh, the, the question was motivated exactly by the kind of uh, statements that motivated David to, to do a survey. We were hearing anecdotes that people said they were investing less in patent-intensive industries, moving toward less patent-reliant industries. Um, and there were, uh, but there were responses to those contentions saying, well, look, venture capital investment has gone up fourfold during this period. Uh, the, the economy has grown, and anecdotally and in terms of, of reports, a lot of patent-intensive startups, patent-reliant startups, are still getting investment. So, you know, show us, show us the numbers. And that's what this study aims to do. It was a policy study. It was a white paper commissioned by the Alliance for U.S. Start Startups and Inventors, USIJ, uh, the primary uh, attraction to me was they had data that other people didn't, which is one reason I'm here presenting. Uh, and so we were able to get data on, uh, they were able to give me data on the period from 2004 to 2017 about uh, venture capital investment, identifying the number of deals and the amount of money invested in, uh, in various uh, identified by industry sector. And so the thesis was that as the patent system has changed, venture capital investment has shifted um, away from patent reliant or patent intensive industries. And there was also a qualitative component to the study. Uh, I interviewed a number of venture capital investors uh, about their decisions uh, they were making and what their motivations were. Uh, actually, Gary was one of them I, I talked to. I talked to several. I'm going to spend less time on that part of the study. Okay, so you face a couple challenges in doing a study like this. Um, first of all, you're trying to examine trends during a period when venture capital investment has grown, when during a period when the economy has grown. So the, the simple answer to this is to examine the relative share of investment in industries that rely on patents versus less patent reliant or patent intensive industries. But then when you think about it, it's actually quite a task to identify which industries are patent intensive. Fortunately, the USPTO has developed a methodology for this and has released studies uh, in 2012 and 2016 looking at this very question. Um, there are some limitations to the USPTO study I'll address briefly later. And so fortunately, the European Patent Office also did a study that was more comprehensive um, that, that is a nice robustness check on the, uh, on the PTO's definition of patent intensive. Of course, uh, ev everybody who knows, anyone who knows a little bit about empirical work will tell you, well, you know, uh, correlation isn't causation. Uh, and, and this wasn't that kind of sophisticated study. It's a broad economy-wide study. We didn't have instrumental variables. It was a quick study. But we used the 
uh, at least we use the qualitative interviews to try to understand what might be motivating these changes. Let's look at the study results. Okay, so first you might want to know a little bit more about the data. So the data was supplied by PitchBook and the National Venture Capital Association. And PitchBook uh, is a data service that collects data on venture capital investment. They have a vast uh, you know, number of sources. They, they crawl the web. They, have, they use machine learning. They, they grab and capture data to count the number of deals done and the amount of money. They had their own way of classifying these, de uh, these deals. They had their own unique identification of industry broken into 200 categories. So I actually had to, to create a concordance to make these categories correspond to the categories more conventionally used by the PTO uh, and other other uh, other entities and and researchers who study industries using industry classification. Let's talk about the PTO patent intensive industries. So the PTO study on patent intensive industries focuses on uh, identifying which industries have the most patents per employee, uh, and they they look really only at manufacturing industries under the assumption that it's the manufacturing industries that are most patent intensive. Uh, and they essentially say the patent intensive ones are the ones above the median in their sample. And so you can see who the patent intensive industries here are. They're some of the ones you would expect, um, computer and, and peripheral uh, equipment, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and so on. Uh, and so what I did is simply look at the, how, what, how the, uh, what the, what, what proportion of venture capital money went to the patent intensive industries identified by the PTO versus all other industries. Uh, and I, I said that the good thing about the PTO's definition of patent intensive industry is that it does include the pharmaceutical industry and life sciences. It might be People don't always think of that as a manufacturing industry, but they treat it as a manufacturing industry. OK, so this is the basic result. The share of total venture capital dollars going to patent intensive industries uh, went from about over 50% in 2004 to just to about 28% in 2017. This this bar graph shows the trade-off between the proportions. We'll get into, we'll break this down into further details as we go. But we do see a, a definite uh, shift in the proportion of deals going and amount of money going to patent intensive industries throughout this period when the, the changes that David talked about with his respondents. Uh, honing in on this, a little bit just to give you some some more detailed numbers we see what happens here and and in this portion what I did was I looked at the all industries to get a sense of where the money was flowing where the share of money was changing and as I said I used the EPO study as a robustness check on the PTO's definition of patent intensive industries and indeed what you find is that the EPO study and, uh, and another study done by Stuart Graham tend to conf uh, confirm the, the PTO's uh, you know, belief that the manufacturing industries are the most patent intensive ones. Those were the ones above the median uh, in patent intensity in the EPO study. And the only addition that, that the PTO didn't include would be software, but it's the last of the top group just above the median. So software is, is the least patent intensive of the uh, more patent intensive industries according to the EPO. And so when we look, we see, when we look at this broad sample and say, okay, the manufacturing industries tend to be the ones that rely on, uh, on patents, we see that their share of venture capital funding, startups and manufacturing went from 41% in 2004 to uh, about 29% 2017. In that same period, um, software really, software really uh, 
benefited from a greater flow, going from about 32% to 40%. Okay. Now, let's break this down more and understand it in terms of specific industries. I think this is where things get interesting. We see who the big winners were and who the biggest losers were in the sample. Now, to try to uh, determine who we should look at and how we should understand and make relevant comparisons. I looked at industries that started or finished with at least 1% share of funding, and I averaged the first five years of the period and the last five years so we didn't get single year effects. Um, and in the end, this represented uh, the majority of the all funding we looked at. So winners and losers here. The industry sectors that gained share were um, were financial services, food and beverage, uh, healthcare technology systems like software systems, restaurants, hotel and leisure, and software were the big winners. The losers included computer hardware, healthcare devices and supplies, pharma and biotech, and semiconductors. By the way, semiconductors was the only industry sector that had an absolute decline in dollars, not just a decline in share of dollars. So you can see these are some of the winners, like food and beverage, fintech, restaurants, hotels and leisure, software, healthcare tech systems. And here we see some of the losers, semiconductors, computer har hardware, healthcare devices and supplies, pharma and biotech. We see biotech does go up toward the end of the period. Um, OK, so let me just give you some key takeaways here. And one of them, I think, uh, comes from the case studies I did where the people I talked to actually did talk about some of their motivations. And they argued that not only were patents essential to risk taking and decision making, but changes in the patent system shifted their interest away. And I think it's always important when we may have these discussions to recognize that investors continue to invest, innovators continue to innovate. But as Jonathan said, their priorities change. And indeed, the, uh, a very successful, one of the very successful case studies in my, that, that I examine uh, is Josh, Josh Makauer's fund. Uh, he's gone through, I think, five or six rounds over the decades. He's had an 80% success rate uh, in developing medical devices and taking, and taking them to an exit event. Um, and they've greatly changed what they focus on. At, in the 90s into the early 2000s, they focused on complex medical devices that weren't planted in the body. You know, they took a lot of FDA clearance, uh, and they, they required a big upfront investment uh, before they ever went to market. He said, you know, in their last, their most recent fund at the time I talked to them, the two out of the, I think, four devices that they were device startups they were funding were focused more on personal health. They were external devices. One was a portable breast pump, and the other device was something he described as a sexual health device. <clears throat> so he, um, he said, you know, we, we, have, we would like to invest in the most socially desirable devices that bring, that address the most chronic and life-threatening disease conditions, but we have investors. We're investing other people's pension money. We follow. Uh, we follow. The money follows where we believe we're, we're most likely to be able to secure a return on our investment, and the availability of patents affects their decision making. So, the key takeaways here, and I'm wrapping this up now, is that while VC funding grew the share of money invested overall, um, the the share in the while VC funding grew overall, the share invested in many critical technologies such as medical devices, biotech, and pharma overall declined. And the less patent uh, intensive sectors, things like social networking, consumer finance, food and beverage, leisure, restaurants, entertainment, investment went up in those areas. And overall, what we see is that as, as, the, as the case study subjects I talked to noted, 
we are less likely to address issues such as cardiovascular disease and chronic diseases such as diabetes and kidney conditions. These high impact types of diseases are not being addressed like they would have been previously. Everybody's less well off. So there's more money going into startups overall, but the share of money going to patent intensive startups has declined, particularly in several key sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so we've heard the empirical evidence, and we're now going to move on to the on-the-ground evidence. Uh, that's one of the things that we've always tried to do at CIP Squared and uh, same entity under a different name, uh, uh, CPIP. Uh, we want to create synergies between um, the insights that you can only get from that type of painstaking research that, that you've uh, just been uh, privileged to hear about and bringing that together with, with what I call uh, reality checks from the ground. And so we're going to merge that together now and to, to get a fuller picture um, of the effect of the, of the devaluation of the patent system on, uh, on the innovation economy. And with that, um, I'm, I'm interested to hear, Sri, what, what you have to say. That sounds great. Thank you very much. And I'm going to give you more of a perspective on why these trends that uh, David and Mark talked about are affecting my industry, which is early stage venture. Um, think of companies that are before they've gotten revenue and early revenue, as opposed to the later ones that are kind of approaching IPO, the type of companies that you guys hear about in the news. So in my world, the question about whether we have a strong, so I'll actually break this up into three different issues. Is it a strong patent system? Is it a weak patent system? Or is it an uncertain patent system? And for, uh, for me as a venture investor, the worst of the three is the uncertainty. If I don't know whether a patent is valid or invalid, infringed or un not infringed, it makes it very hard as a business asset for me to invest behind it as, uh, in order to figure out how I'm going to get a return on my investment. How is a company down the road going to acquire my company if they don't understand that what they're acquiring is valuable beyond the, the um, revenue that the company is generating. And so I'm going to focus on kind of two words that came up in the earlier talks. First, um, going to one of David's points very early on, if you looked at the number of venture capitalists that are knowledgeable versus not knowledgeable about the patent system, most venture capitalists, and I think those numbers were actually over-exaggerated, most venture capitalists do not understand patents. It's not, what, it's not their world. They might have heard of Alice. They might have heard of Mayo. But they really don't understand what it means. And to an extent, it doesn't matter to them. What they want to know is, can I protect it? Can, I, can someone who acquires my company leverage that to own that industry? Or is this a wasted asset that we spent money on that will never drive any sort of value? And so then the second piece of this goes to something that Mark mentioned, reliability. On his very first slide, one of the two key pieces was reliability. And that is by far the most important things for us. When the patent system becomes unreliable, when no matter how well I draft a patent, I don't know whether or not infringements, you know, I can prove infringement or even keep my kept patent valid. If I, if I don't know those metrics up front, then I have very little incentive to invest in a patent for its typical reasoning, which is, you know, it may, uh, controlling a market or owning a market in, in what we do. And so instead, it becomes more of a PR tool. It is great for marketing. It is great to say I have a patent, but I will never actually use it. I don't want to go into a three-year, you know, $3 million to $5 million lawsuit that's going to put my company at risk with a huge uncertainty of whether I'm going to win or lose. And so patents suddenly change. Suddenly, my, my impetus is not so much I need as we've talked, as, as you heard to date so far, I need IP protection. These are companies that are small. They are looking to be acquired by bigger players. Bigger players want to know what they're acquiring. What, what advantage are they getting by acquiring this company? So I need IP protection. The problem is, is that I may not be able to rely on patent protection. Instead, I might rely on uh, most likely trade secret protection, which we'll be talking about in panel six. We'll also be fixing on more things around brand, so more focus on trademark, on culture, on, on market share, on uh, market visibility, rather than technological ad advantage. And so 
that changes my investment focuses. So when I'm looking at a company now, and a company tells me I have three pens, I have five pens, I have eight pens, my first question is always going to be, why? Why did you get those pens? Okay, you've got three pens. What are you going to do with them? What do, how do, if you spend, let's say on average, the number I picked for most of my startups is 50000 If you spend $50,000 on a patent, and that is, you know, filing fees, prosecution fees, maintenance fees over 20 years, and if you're going to keep this alive in the patent office for 20 years, it's going to cost you $50,000. How do I get $500,000 of value? I need a 10 to 1 return um, because of the uncertainty around it. How am I getting that type of value? Most of the time, it's not going to be because someone's going to acquire me because they can sue someone on this, on this single patent. There's way too many ways right now to knock out a patent. So with the uncertainty of the validity of the patent, which also creates uncertainty of, of getting any damages for infringement, what does it become? It becomes a PR tool. It becomes I can talk to the public about having a patent protected. And that is great, but it definitely changes the economics of why I get a patent, of how much I'm willing to spend on a patent, and what I'm willing to do with that patent once I have it. You know, now you're looking more at cross-licensing, at licensing deals, <coughs> at, at uh, PR. That's kind of now changed the focus of what we tend to use the patent system for, whereas technological innovation tends to more stay, when I look at a company, tends to really focus on trade secret because I have control of that. Maybe I don't have as much protection if I, lever if I really put a lot of focus on trade secret, but I have much more reliability. And so in that world, that's how the, these changes, Alice and Bilski and Mayo, those changes to the patent law really affect business decisions. Um, we were talking some, with some people last night, and the, hard, the hardest part about all of this when drafting patents, and so when I talk to companies these days, we often talk about drafting very, very, very detailed patents. And the reason behind it is, to be honest, by the time the patent gets out of the patent office, one, and by the time the patent's actually in play in the business world, two, you're talking 10 or 15 years down the road. I don't know as a patent attorney, and my companies definitely don't know, what is the patent laws that are going to be in effect at that time. The Supreme Court has said their decisions do not change patent law. They just change the business world misunderstood what patent law meant. I'm not going to agree or disagree with that statement, but that puts a huge amount of uncertainty on what, what is val valid, what is... A pat uh, what is patentable today, because I don't know what the rules are going to be in play by the time I actually come out of the patent office. And so in view of that, we put a lot more of our focus on the rest of the IP world, as opposed to patent. In the past, when this wasn't so much in play, patents were the way that you really defined. You owned a market. That's why you got acquired. Now it is, OK, what are you doing that allows you to be unique um, beyond the beyond your competition, beyond what else is out there. And so from an early stage investor, and we'll hear um, from later stage investors, but from an early stage investor, that becomes hugely important for an industry that is built on innovation. That's all, if you think of my world, a startup, a startup that, that is VC funded is one that is looking to either go IPO or get acquired by a big company for a lot of money. No one is buying them because no large company is buying them because they think that this company that's making $1 million, $2 million, $10 million, $20 million of revenue is all that important. That's peanuts to these large companies. They're buying them because there's something about that company that's unique that they can leverage given their resources to take that and grow it exponentially. Without a strong patent system, with a weak patent system, or even worse, with an uncertain patent system, that, that leverage to be bought for that reason changes dramatically unless you've got other ways of protecting yourself. And so you will see shifts into industries that are more, you're more able to protect through other means, through trade secrets. So you saw uh, increases in software, whether it is software on the internet or software tech, shifts away from hardware. Why? Hardware is really hard to protect. Once it's out in the world, anyone can copy it. Software, when it's behind a server, very hard to attack. You know, there might be ways to figure it out, and there might be things, and there's all sorts of uh, espionage things and all the other ways to attack it, but easier to protect from a VC's perspective, from an early stage company's perspective, from an acquirer's perspective. 
And so a lot of our role as, as investors in helping figure out which of these companies that have great ideas. I, I, I come from Pittsburgh. I'm around CMU and Pitt and Duquesne. Tons of great ideas. There's no lack of great ideas to invest in, but great teams into ideas that are actually going to get acquired and be protectable and not just be copied and rendered mute once we actually prove it's valuable. Those are harder decisions when the patent system is weak. And so that's kind of where, as an investor, my, my role ends. And then that's my advice to a lot of my startups. And I know I've talked with Director Yanku and others. And I know in the patent world, especially for those who are worried about patent policy, it's not what people want to hear. People don't want to hear that we're avoiding patents. But the answer is, given the amount of uncertainty now and into the future, it's, it, it, it significantly decreases the value of having a patent as opposed to other forms of IP to protect yourself. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Gary. Thank you, Sri. And uh, Sri, I love the fact that you're based in Pittsburgh because the US innovation economy at, at one time, one of its centers was in the Midwest. If you came in on an airplane, you can thank a little bicycle shop in Columbus, Ohio. That's where it started. <laughs> So I appreciate the invitation, and um, uh, we'll, um, um, so the, um, uh, this uh, is a continuation in part of a uh, presentation I gave uh, with this organization in its prior name. Uh, I strive to make all my presentations novel, useful, and <laughs> non-obvious, um, uh, although this does recycle some prior material, which is why it's a continuation. Um, there, much that is new and improved, but um, my, my prior art was uh, um, about uh, in March of 2020, and I'm curious, uh, how many of you have seen that presentation? Can you raise your hand? Only one. Okay, great. So yeah, for, uh, for you, it, uh, it may not be as new, but it's mostly new. So. Um, my style is that uh, since one can read much faster than you can listen, um, and you can listen much faster than most people speak, and since spare mental cycles tend to lead to multitasking, which lowers retention, I'm going to try to use the, uh, those spare cycles and rely on the Doppler effect, which is the tendency of stupid ideas to seem smarter when they come at you rapidly. Um, <laughs> so I'm a, venture, I'm a venture capitalist. I've invested over half a billion in venture capital the past 37 years, over 150 companies, over 100 funds. I'm not a lawyer, but I keep many well fed. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm an inventor, co-inventor in about 17 issued patents. Um, I've been involved in some amicus briefs, and um, I have no interest in any troll, PAE, or entity behaving as such. My expertise is as a VC and, um, uh, and the role that patents play in that and how patents can affect the success of small companies. Um, patents don't matter much to software and internet, as we've already seen, um, uh, although some of those results are kind of surprising, I have to say. Um, so, um, but they do to most other technologies. Um, uh, um, the National Venture Capital Association, of which I'm a member, the board um, had software internet types who didn't like patents. Um, and so the NBCA had been mild in its criticism of prior builds. Um, in 2014, that changed, but now they're losing interest again, unfortunately. Um, uh, so, okay, we, t we talked about this, uh, um, uh, and, but one thing we, um, not as clear, since the um, PTO takes so many years to issue and there's many, many more years for enforcement, that's too slow for many types of businesses, especially software and internet, which move very quickly. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why it makes it less relevant for them. Um, and um, patents are needed for innovations that are easy to copy once the pioneer has shown the way. Uh, uh, medical devices and biotech are a good, clear example, but energy and clean tech, internet of things, semiconductors, electronics, optics, for example, LIDAR for automating vehicles, most tangible things um, uh, and others that are miscellaneous and yet to be invented. Um, so in, investors tend to think differently. Um, this is an allusion to a Apple's think different. Um, so, um, and creativity is often associated with non-neurotypical people. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, ex obsessive compulsive people, uh, not necessarily disorder, it's not always a disorder if it doesn't interfere with one's ability to function. There's a wonderful book called America's Obsessives, the compulsive energy that built a nation. Um, which talks a lot about those. Uh, uh, dyslexia, dyslexics are disproportionately represented among CEOs and founders of companies. Um, there's a, a book about that, the creativity associated with that called The Mind's Eye. 
um, autism spectrum disorders. Um, Temple Grandin being an example of a, uh, a well-known inventor who is uh, very much on that spectrum. And, um, uh, and then in my own experience, I've also seen bipolar and schizophrenia. Um, so um, in other words, not all of these talented people are otherwise employable. Um, uh, some could only be CEOs because they, they can't uh, you know, uh, they can't deal with uh, reporting to someone and vice versa. And, um, and many just don't work well in organizations. But for 247 years, many have been thriving in this country um, by inventing. And um, this, there have been huge externalities that benefited all of us uh, from that. And uh, I think this is an interesting topic uh, worthy of research. I'm, I'm bringing this up because there are so many researchers in the room. Let's put it out there for, uh, to, to suggest. So. You know, incumbents like incumbency, it turns out. Um, and uh, Joseph Schumpeter coined the phrase creative destruction and um, new technology, usually from the entrance, swept away old and thereby improved things. But lo and behold, the incumbents don't like the destruction part of that. So um, uh, patents have been hugely important for this, but unfortunately are declining. Um, and despite the patent system being on its deathbed, big tech is not done trying to destroy it. Um, and uh, um, they've been taking a somewhat different approach than in the past. Um, so that now they primarily hide behind shills that pretend to advocate for small companies. Um, so exhibit A um, is engine advocacy, uh, which has testified in many, uh, on patent issues many times. Google has funded it since its inception in 2013. Um, and in 2018, this report came out uh, called The Lobbyist in the Garage. Um, and the subtext, in case you can't read it, is uh, uh, Engine says it's the voice of startups in the government. It serves Google's corporate interests instead. And if you look at what they say, um, they, they pretend to, uh, to be speaking on behalf of small entities who are uh, suffering from patent trolls, but, uh, but really it's actually um, Google and other big techs wanting to weaken all patents. So exhibit B, um, uh, news from this Monday, um, Apple flexes its muscle as quiet power behind App Developer Group, the App Association, um, which claimed to represent all the little app makers. Lo and behold, most of their budget comes from Apple, and their positions are, uh, are those of Apple. And, uh, and if you look on their website, there's lots of uh, statements uh, over the past many years about patents, mostly SCP-related uh, patent stuff. but. You know, yet another shill. Um, uh, so, uh, so anyway, this. Um, so, why do they hide behind shills? Well, to deceive people regarding who benefits from this. Um, they want to pretend it's not for them; it's for little companies, um, and to reduce the risk of blowback, more tech lash, um, and. Uh, Trying to hide actions is inherently suspicious, um, and I, the best antidote is to expose it. So, I recommend it. Um, so uh, um, in the uh, in the 1870s, um, uh, this um, the railroad industry tried to destroy the patent system. They were being su uh, sued for patent infringement too much, especially by George Westinghouse, who invented the air brake that they were using and, and not uh, not licensing. Um, and uh, this this was. Uh, um, uh, it's in a similar story today with big tech. Um, ex uh, the, um, Steve Haber and Naomi Lemmer wrote this excellent book, which I recommend. Another great book I recommend, um, uh, at the risk of sucking up to the moderator, <laughs> is Jonathan Barnett's book. Um, uh, uh, history should be taught in order to avoid repeating it, uh, which unfortunately we are repeating today. Um, and another recent history lesson uh, regarding Google um, that uh, hopes to address why they are so anti-patent. Um, so one hypothesis um, that I have is that it may be due to one of my companies um, that sued Google in 2002. Um, its name uh, um, was goto.com. They later changed their name to Overture. Um, they invented the paid search um, ranking m model, which um, uh, which Google, well, I'll get to it. So, so go to miss the filing deadline on their core IP by one day. Uh, someone, I think, put it on the wrong day on the calendar or something. And, uh, but they, they did patent uh, secondary stuff. And um, ultimately, um, Google copied uh, this company and improved upon it. Uh, that's what became AdWords, which is their primary business model today. And um, uh, there was a patent lawsuit, and in 2004, there was a settlement where Google paid them 2.7 million shares, um, which is for their main business. It's a, which is a meaningful settlement, but um, 
uh, so that I, th I suspect that that left a bad taste in their mouth, um, but uh, they are still at it. Um, so uh, yeah, um, for those who are not aware, see the Sonos versus Google um, uh, uh, lawsuit. Um, it's serious misbehavior by Google. Um, it could easily, they could easily have afforded uh, a license, um, and they're wielding their balance sheet to file frivolous cases. Um, and such behavior should, in my opinion, be an antitrust uh, violation. And um, uh, yesterday I asked a question about, uh, about this issue of the um, antitrust panel, and they felt that uh, that would be hard to rein in due to the Nor Pennington doctrine. Um, I think that should be looked at more closely. Um, so. Um, I, I, and another uh, proposal I have is perhaps the, a new law requiring the plaintiff to fund the expenses for the defendant and, and uh, with uh, a function of the ratio of their respective market caps. Um, so um, anyway, I allege that TechLash has been misdirected um, and that the destruction of the patent system is the, um, the worst actions that big tech has brought about. Um, and, and I should also add, it's not just big tech that has been undermining the patent system. There are a number of other um, uh, trade associations representing various industries that don't like patents because they don't, uh, they, um, they're not, uh, they don't use patents for their market power, and so they always find themselves on the defendant's uh, end of things, which is, uh, and, and therefore they, um, they hop aboard on their lobbying against patents, but they're all, we're all beneficiaries of the patent system insofar as we consume medical uh, services and live in the, a modern society, but nevertheless, um, lots of people are on that bandwagon. Um, and uh, um, anyway, th it's virtually unknown that the patent system has, uh, has been substantially harmed, nor, uh, nor who's behind it. Um, and uh, I believe these perspectives need to disseminate outwards. Um, so. Uh, there's, uh, and I also allege that the savings um, that the uh, uh, big tech and others have uh, for, uh, by reducing the, the strength of the patent system are not material to, even to them in terms of fraction of revenues or fra uh, fraction of, of profits. They're you know, less than a, base, uh, a basis point. So, um, uh, and so I suspect and believe that they would stop what they're doing if there were blowback for this behavior. So you can all help create that. So in conclusion, I think we need legislation to, uh, to strengthen the system and um, the traditional opponents of this should reconsider, um, uh, uh, should reconsider their, their, what they're doing. And um, antitrust law should be applied for PTAB pylons and um, uh, courts need better IP awareness and understanding of what's at stake. Um, and you all have a role to play. Um, and you please use your voice to help fix all this. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, and thank you to my fellow panelists. Uh, I think uh, we've, we've heard some really interesting uh, empirical research and case studies about the real world effects that the uh, reduction in the strength of the patent system over uh, almost two decades now has been having on the innovation economy. What I'd like to do in the, in the remaining portion um, of our time is uh, first to give you some homework, uh, which is to uh, formulate some questions for us. And as you are inspired, uh, please uh, feel free to approach uh, the nearest microphone, and uh, we will be happy to, um, to take your questions. Um, before I give some questions myself to, to the panelists, um, I wanted to just situate some of the research uh, that, that you've heard uh, within the broader context. So scholarly research is especially the empirical database research, which we have always emphasized here. It takes longer to do, but, but we're, our, our mission is to ground policy based on evidence, not, not based on rhetoric uh, and not based on anecdote. And it takes time to collect that and, and to confirm it. And while the evidence that, that uh, Mark and David has, have presented, at, as is inherent to the beginning of any, um, any literature, uh, is, is preliminary, I think we can have a good deal of confidence that it's pointing in, in, in the same direction and, and, and starting to give us a fuller picture because it's consistent with other literature that's out there. So just to give you the broader landscape, there's two very famous survey studies that one was done in the late 80s and one in the 2000s. 
And these are commonly cited for the view that patents don't matter. How did they show that? They went around to a bunch of firms and they asked them to rank patents, how important are they to capture revenue on your R&D? And most of them outside pharma said, not that important, but here's one problem. The only companies that they asked about were really big companies like on the S&P 500. So there was a hole in the literature and that was filled by a study that was done a little bit later called the Berkeley Patent Survey and they looked at small firms. And that ranking order of patents being on the bottom was basically flipped. Okay? And it was flipped most consistently in the areas that you're seeing, you're hearing about today. Biopharma, medical devices, IT hardware. Now let's think about those industries. Are they not the industries that this administration in a, in a bipartisan consensus agrees that these are the core industries in the US innovation economy today? So now let's think about that again. Over the past 15 years, the US Supreme Court, in every case with unanimity or near unanimity, has believed with confidence that every step they've taken, which at every step has weakened the patent system, is what is necessary to preserve innovation. Two of those cases specifically target medical devices. Look what we're seeing in the empirical evidence. Two, two studies, but two studies that are consistent with an earlier literature, and they're both showing adverse effects specifically on the industry the Supreme Court purported that it was, it was intending to save. It has done the exact opposite. This is the missing piece in US innovation policy today. Uh, the administration, bipartisan consensus in Congress is committed to innovation, but nothing has been done to correct any of the Supreme Court cases. Uh, nothing has been done to address the uh, almost complete absence of injunctive relief from the IT industries. So what I'd like to start by doing is to go to um, our academic panelists. Um, Mark and David, you've done, done important work here. Your work is converging on similar results, um, which gives us comfort that, 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 that we're getting a fuller, accurate picture. What more do you feel you would like to do or you'd like to see other researchers doing um, to get, to get a, more, a more complete empirical handle of what's going on? And I, David or Mark, you feel free to go, go first. I'll go first. Um, so there's private equity and, and, you know, there's private investment, but there's also the government investing. And that's something I have not explored, right? It's a policy decision. Do we want to create a system that rewards or encourages um, private investment in innovation? I mean, that's the purpose of the patent system, and that's why we have the law. But there's, a, there's another model, and maybe it doesn't have to be an either or, but one thing I have not explored, and, and some, you know, there's criticisms of my work. I'm sure there's criticisms of your work. Um, one, one response to my work has been, well, venture capital and private equity investment has been increasing dramatically during this period in which you're saying these investors are reporting decreasing investments or shifting investments. And my response is always, well, just imagine how much more investment there would have been had the Supreme Court not done what it did. Or imagine we, didn't, we did not have these shifting of investments out of these industries. How much more innovation would we have in uh, medical device technology or pharmaceutical technology? That's one response. But there's also something I have not explored, which is this alternative, the government investing. I mean, the government does invest. The government gives grants to universities to do research, and the university's more basic research, and we could have that debate as well, like what should the government be funding? But what I haven't explored is has the government stepped in to fill the gap to the extent that there is a shifting of investment out of particular industries? Has the government stepped up to say, well, we're not gonna, since we've changed the system to, uh, shift investments out of these industries. Let's use our tax revenue and invest in innovation in these industries. I have not explored that, but I think, I mean, I have a, I have a suspicion that that has not happened, but I don't know, I haven't seen the data. So I think some of the, the interesting things to, to look at further would be, well, first, firstly, things like you know, causality. There, there could be much more sophisticated things done with this, this data. This was a relatively quick study aimed at policymakers, uh, not not at you know placing in an econ journal. But it's important to get 
that kind of uh, those, the, that kind of more you know robust uh, defensible study. But I think also I think it would be interesting to look at certain outcomes in more detail. And this is why I, I, I enjoy um, doing case studies and talking to people who actually invest and innovate. This is you know why when I you know co-founded the 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 organization formerly known as CPIP, um, now now CIP squared, we we brought those people to the table because they tell you things and and they tell you interesting things that that help you understand better and sometimes it's it's really useful to confirm those anecdotes. So I think there are issues like industry composition. Uh, so yes, there's still investment in certain industries, but uh, the nature of the investment has changed. And it's like I, I talked about during my presentation that you, know, they're, they're, you have investors that have expertise in certain areas, so they're still investing in startups in those industries, in those fields, but they're investing in things differently. They're doing things differently. As I talked about, they were investing, the, the one uh, medical device investment and development group was investing in lifestyle devices, things that didn't require FDA approval, uh, that didn't have a long uh, and risky development ramp. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's interesting because we, I think we can make some conclusions of so we can, we can think about social utility. You know, are we happy that that people are investing more in uh, social media, in food and beverage uh, versus you know implantable devices? Uh, they, I ask them, you know, what what are, are there any? Is there anything you wish you could be involved in that you're not? And they they talked about, um, you know, using using more uh, you know more high tech implants in the body uh, that that could could help regulate systems and accomplish things they said there's just you know that's riskier than it ever was before um, and and they also have begun to rely on trade secrecy or some of the same things that that my fellow panelists said so some of those things would be interesting to look at the nature of of what's getting invested in not just it's because we, we, we aren't necessarily better off as a society if people are you know, inv you know, investing more in X than Y. Uh, the investors might not, in some sense, might be indifferent if they're making money, but if we're saving fewer lives uh, and, and improving fewer lives, that's, that's disappointing. Um, another thing that would be interesting to look at uh, are you know, so how, how certain business models were impacted by changes. Uh, I, I heard I heard that from case studies and from other instances too of, of talking to investors and innovators. They were able to uh, to note that they had particular startups that essentially were were killed by by particular Supreme Court decisions. You know, this was a viable company until it hit this wall of a Supreme Court decision because we could no longer protect what we were doing, uh, and we couldn't get another round of fun funding or or a competitor was able to copy us with impunity. So I think that that would be another interesting thing to look at to see kind of what the what the change is. You know, we have the exogenous shock of a Supreme Court decision, and you know, did and did that. You know, whose fortunes did that change? It did change fortunes. So. Yeah, um, I would uh, I would add a couple things. Uh, firstly. Um, the growth in venture capital investment um, that's occurred over in the time frames that you, that you were looking at includes in, uh, investments in, in companies like WeWork, um, dog walking companies, uh, services. What a um, friend of mine was the CEO of one of them that got, I think, $200 million of investment. Cloud kitchens and food delivery services. Um, these are not exactly patent intensive uh, uh, services. And, uh, and it's also the case that what used to be funded by IPOs, um, since IPOs are happening later, are now often funded by what is called venture capital. And so it's not really an apples to apples comparison with the past if one considers those facts. Garrett, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'll add one other uh, comment to this, is that the data basically ended, I believe, 2017, 2018. The world has significantly shifted in the last five years. Uh, I don't think anyone disagrees. Uh, taking uh, 
irrelevant of COVID, the world has moved in five years. I mean, arguably what we talk about is a transition from the industrial age to now the information age. And the data we've looked at and the data we've talked about is all relevant to the past. It would be interesting to understand how the system has to change given where the world is headed to in the future. Um, if I might add, um, apropos of uh, what was um, said, what you, your remarks earlier, um, the, uh, um, the, the HTIA lobbying organization stands for the High Tech Inventors Alliance. Um, and these are the giant companies that uh, we talked about. Um, they, that's the ultimate double speak. They call themselves inventors, and yet they don't invent a whole lot. Um, and just a case in point, um, Apple uh, has uh, profits of uh, over $100 billion per year. And if you watched the last um, uh, um, performance by Tim Cook of uh, renouncing all the, the various new products, it's amazing how little um, they managed to innovate on with their $100 billion a year of profits. Yeah, I'll just add to that. A Apple's R&D intensity, which is the amount of its revenues that it plows back into R&D, is about 6%. If you compare that to patent-intensive companies like Qualcomm, Nokia and Ericsson, those stand at about 15%. If you look at pharma, which is patent, obviously our most patent-dependent industry, it exceeds 20%. So the aggregate picture here, and I'm excited to move on to the questions, and that will occupy the remainder of our time, is just to point out what's happened here. The devaluation of the patent system has shifted wealth to one sector of the economy that relies on one particular business model, and it has disadvantaged every other business model from monetizing innovation. And that is clearly inefficient because it's not allowing capital to freely allocate itself across all business models. It reduces it to only one. And with that, I will turn to the audience. I'm excited to hear the questions. I think our uh, First question is over here on my right-hand side. Uh, please state your name and affiliation, please. Rick Neifeld, Neifeld IP Law, sole practitioner, <laughs> LLC. So uh, my question is, I guess, to each of the panelists, considering the biggest changes over the last 20 years in patent protection and how the following revisions to those changes would affect the data you presented, the conclusions you draw, in your specific area, and the big question whether this change would be better or worse for society generally, not just in your specific niche, like not just in uh, you know, small venture startups uh, seeker, but in the big picture. After all, it may be that we're better off with Google and Apple controlling our lives <clears throat> than having small companies start up and challenge them and create new industries. I don't believe that, but it's theoretically possible. So here are the three big changes for the last 20 years. There was the <clears throat> removal presumption of irreparable harm for infringement, and that basically killed the right to an injunction in many cases, tempered it down. Very big change, right? There was the extension or continuance of ju judicial exceptions to patentability under 101, which is Mayo, Alice, and everything else that follows the increase in cost that brought in the reduction in the scope of things that can be patentable or enforceable. And the third was the creation of the PTEB's right to try the validity of patents. Those are the, the three biggest things. So in the big picture, the irreparable harm position was basically policy decision, right? There's no real, um, there's no statutory change that was uh, that was required for that Supreme Court decision. The judicial exceptions to patentability could be removed by legislative fiat in a single sentence. All, except, all exceptions to patentability under 101 are hereby abrogated, period, end of story. All right. Um, that would be a big change, right? And uh, you'd couple that with a redefinition of the word do in 101 because Adam keeps tell, Adam Mossinghoff keeps telling me, banging me over the head, that uh, new as a, as, a, as a term of art in patent law. And new can simply mean what it means in the dictionary, new, not existing before in nature. Done, right? Put that in the statute. You're done in point two. Point three is 
Well, in 2012, we got the, PTAP, the, ex the extension of the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences, killing the interference and creating all these new proceedings that, the, in the past, Sunrise, the CBMs, the IPRs, and the PGRs, and the derivations. So, but those, there's an alternative remedy. Just go to court like you used to and defend your, patent, defend your uh, infringement if you think the patent's invalid. So we don't really need that. It's simply another tool for big people to kill patents, for good or for bad, right? So the question is, maybe a quick sentence or two from each of you, how the, those three changes, get rid of the judicial exceptions, get rid of the, the re re return to the presumption of irreparable harm for purposes of injunctions, right? And, and get rid of the PTAB's right to cancel validly issued patents, those three changes. How would, if those three changes occurred, how would that affect do you think, speculate, your data, your conclusions, and the big picture, better or worse for society? Okay, that'd thank be great. You. Thank you. Uh, we have a we have a number of questions, which which is great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, one of our panelists to res to to respond to that question. And could that and be then could that be Sikar then, please? I'd what? like to hear his response specifically. I, that would be okay. great. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make my response relatively quick in that. These are all effects. I think the, the big question is, is how do you make the system, the, 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 these, each of these were created for a specific reason to address a specific problem. They just happen to be a very big hammer for a very small nail. How do we narrow that down to do, the, do what was intended correctly, whether through legislation or through activism or through explaining to the Supreme Court why this is important? needs better advocates than Google or Google shills, more talks from the NVCA actually representing the smaller investor, inventors and true inventors coming up. And so I don't know if I have a specific answer for these specific three things other than to say the intent might not have been bad, but the application was horrible. And so we need better, better understanding of unintended consequences when applying judicial activism or legislative intent. Thank you, thank you, Sri. Uh, let's uh, move on to Alex from uh, Global Antitrust Institute. Thanks, I don't have to identify myself then. If I, I know, have if a, we, if we know um, you. <laughs> um, a uh, question or suggestion for Professor Taylor. Um, it seems like you have the data potentially to um, create based on uh, Professor Schultz's crosswalk of the USPTO patent intensive industries, you could come up with a measure for each survey respondent of what proportion of their investment is in patent intensive industries. It would be interesting to see, um, is there a correlation, for example, between it, that kind of intensiveness and the knowledge of the Supreme Court cases, but also um, whether there's a relationship between uh, that patent industry intensive uh, proportion of investment uh, and the responses as to whether investment will go, has gone up or down. Um, you could imagine that uh, an investment firm that has a lot of industry-specific human capital in patent-intensive industries, that as patent protections go down, that human capital investment is stranded. And so it's more difficult for them to shift out to other types, um, other industries. Um, so it would be interesting to see whether there's um, a way to check that in your data. Yeah, thanks. I don't know if you called for a response, but, um, but yeah, I appreciate the feedback. And, um, you know, mo most, I mean, I've gotten criticism, but one of the criticisms is it's, it's expressed preferences, it's not revealed preferences. And I think Marx is more directed towards revealed preferences. And I think, so that's, that's kind of the next step. Um, it's also kind of hard to correlate. It's gonna be hard because a lot of these investors um, invest in multiple industries. So it's, I'm not focused on industry and the investments in the industry, I'm focused on the investors. And it turns out the investors invest in lots of industries. 
so that, so that's that's going to make this your suggestion uh, pretty hard to to do. That's what makes it possible mm -hmm. because there's variation in how those investors yeah, invest true. their money. Are they patent intensive industry investments or are they more broadly spread? If they're more broadly spread, you would expect that the ability to shift resources from patent intensive to other industries would be easier. Okay, yeah. So the question is, does Good point. That yeah. Right. Well, it's a good point. I, what I have not done is looked in to see um, the differences in how spread their investments are amongst the industries, and I probably could do that with the data I have. You're right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, just, just, just to add to that, I think as we push forward on this, uh, this literature, which I think is very, very important, one of the things we're probably going to have to do is to narrow it down, industry by industry, and also to take into account technological substitutes for IP, the, 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 um, the findings presented yesterday by Pref uh, Professor Brandstetter, who could have been on this panel just as easily, showed you that within biopharma, they're able to exploit certain technologies in order to shift capital away from the patent-dependent industries. But note there again, that's a distortion it's probably giving a rise to an inefficiency, at least on a gross basis, because it is moving innovation capital into an innovation sector where you have to rely on secrecy. Secrecy inherently has an efficiency cost because you're limiting the dissemination of knowledge. This is often a point that's overlooked, that even when the market can adapt apparently successfully to a low IP environment, your innovation volume, let's say, stays constant. The quality of innovation stays constant. Usually the price you pay is that information stays in-house. The market, at least on that parameter, has become less competitive. So with that, um, I don't know who's can first. Just, can I just add a point? Oh, OK, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, the patent system, the patents first emerged in, in Venice in the 14th century in response to the guilds at the time, which were all about trade secrets. So yeah. quite, quite inefficient. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd also like to add that the, um, uh, oops, sorry. Um, that, uh, never mind. That's, uh, that's Apple calling. Yeah. <laughs> Should we go ahead? Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Philip Rogers. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Uh, so your talk got me feeling very Hegelian, very dialectic, thesis and antithesis, right? We talk about hardware versus software. We talk about manufacturing versus the new information age. Uh, but then, of course, there's synthesis. And in many ways, that's IoT, right? It's both hardware and software. It's sort of this information, but also bridging the, uh, the gap with manufacturing. So I was just wondering if very briefly, a panelist of the moderator's choosing, or perhaps the moderator himself, uh, would like to talk a, a little bit more about IoT in regards to uh, what you talked about today. I'll give one panelist a chance to respond to that, and I just want to make sure we have time for all our questions. <laughs> Well, a quintessential IoT product um, uh, is uh, the tile, um, the, the small devices that are used for, uh, for tracking things that um, um, very clever innovation to taking advantage of people's Bluetooth um, and the phone's inherent capability to know where they are. Uh, Apple copied that and improved upon it um, with their new AirTags. Um, the ethical thing for, the, for Apple to have done would have been to buy, buy that company using the rounding error amount of their money, but instead they just knocked it off. I have no idea whether the, uh, there's a patent lawsuit that's coming out of that. Maybe they're not going to bother to sue because of the hopelessness of suing. But that's a clear example of the, how patents should be important, but unfortunately seem not to be. Great. Uh, questioner on my left-hand side. Joe Rosigliano, Hoffman, and Barron. And this really goes to uh, Professor Taylor and Professor Schultz. You both have talked about where your data ends, and you're looking for modern correlates. Well, I'll tell you, there is a really great modern correlate for what you're seeing in investment and the patent world. I had the great misfortune of looking at my portfolio this weekend in detail. Now, we all know what's happened to the market since August. If you take a look at the sectors that you see the most uh, money coming out of, I can promise you the EFTs in those sectors have performed markedly worse than the EFTs in the other sectors. Look at your biotech indexes. They've been slaughtered by 
40 to 60 percent. Whereas in the other areas, you're seeing a 20 percent drop in line with the S&P. So if you want a modern correlate, I can tell you where to look, gentlemen. That's where it is. It's real fast to get. Well, I think Any it's responses? more of a comment than a <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> question. Yeah. All right. We'll move to our last, uh, last questioner. Go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, Josh Hartman with Merchant & Gould. Um, I'm curious about uh, panel's views on the role that non-practicing entities have played in the kind of where we are now, how we got here in terms of the market distortions that you've talked about. A lot of the um, developments over the last dozen years or so that have weakened the patent system, starting with eBay, the creation of the PTAB, Alice, um, I'd add uh, the development of damages uh, case law at the Federal Circuit. Um, these are all reactions to the kind of rise in non-practicing entities. And I'm wondering if what's kind of happened is that the baby's been thrown out with the bathwater, uh, that industries or sectors that are really patent dependent have borne the brunt of uh, these changes that probably started from a somewhat sensible place. Well, you know, Gary's slides ref refer to some older history. You know, non-practicing entities is just a new label for an old thing. You know, the, if you look back at, at 19th century historical studies, we see the importance of a licensing market. You, you could easily call Thomas Edison a non-practicing entity after all. Um, certainly some things changed, and one should also ask what NPEs, so-called, are a reaction to. We, we can focus on patent assertion entities if you prefer. You know, it's, but, but you know, to some extent, we see the rise of these entities as, as the little guy has trouble enforcing their patents, as it gets more costly, litigation costs are high. Um, they, they, you know, the, the PAEs or NPEs in the system help keep, help keep things honest because that little guy who, you know, was, whose patent was infringed by Amazon or Google or, or Apple probably doesn't have the resources to do much about it um, and certainly isn't competing in the marketplace. But, but that, that, entity, that entity now, you know, takes advantage of that opportunity, sometimes as a litigation opportunity rather than a competition opportunity, but, but it's a reaction partly to the difficulty of, of enforcing your patents as a, a smaller player. Um, no. no. Well, I would also add that there, um, uh, there's a couple of different things in play. So uh, the, there's contingency law firms um, who can help existing operating companies, and then there's uh, like non-practicing entities, which by definition are not operating the, the patent in question. And the, um, the latter, I think, have arisen for a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, often when a company winds up failing, often due to the, their product having been copied, um, then, the, then the, that's when the patents would typically be uh, tempted to be monetized by an NPE. And in, in that type of situation, um, I think it, it is right and just for them to go after the people who put them out of business. Um, and this did happen with one of my companies that invented asymmetrical cable modems. Um, uh, which all, all cable modems today are asymmetrical. Um, so the, uh, um, but I think that part of the reason for the emergence of NPEs is um, uh, if you look back in time, it, um, typically the, um, the entities arose to help com uh, uh, operating companies with their defense by licensing them uh, piles of patents that could be, then be asserted back against the plaintiff. And so uh, if, an, if an entity is not operating, then they're basically not going to be liable uh, for any of those types of suits. Um, and so that, um, the, that, I think, is one of the things that has um, driven the rise of NPEs. And yet another one um, has been the, um, the slowness with which patents were issued, because often by the time the patent wound up being delivered to the company, it was done. Um, and, and had it been delivered sooner, then the company might have had more of a chance. Um, so all those things, I think, have contributed. And I'll add one more piece, and it goes back to the earlier response to the question, is, is that there are bad actors. I don't think anyone in this room disagrees that there are bad actors in the NPE or patent assertion world, or whatever you want to call it. The problem is, is the solution became such a big hammer that a lot of good actors got taken into the side, and it's really weakened the system as a whole. So are there bad actors? Yes. Do we need to address them? Yes. 
but maybe the PTAB, maybe 101 extensions, maybe changes in the presumption of irreparable, irreparable harm weren't the right solutions for the problem that they were addressing. And I was, uh, one other comment. In, in the last speech that I referenced in, um, in, my, in my talk, I did address this rather extensively. I noticed you didn't say patent trolls. Um, uh, patent trolls are it's a very pejorative term, but I, what I think is interesting, when, we, when, when I at least say patent troll, I typically am thinking of a, of a patent assertion entity, but I have this idea that their patents are probably invalid, they're probably not infringed, they're the bad actor. I don't like patent trolls, no one likes patent trolls. If you call it a patent troll, you don't like them. Non-practicing entity is more of a neutral term, but what's interesting is you'll see rhetoric that um, companies that have been mentioned before today, they'll lose a patent infringement case. In other words, the patent is found not invalid, it's found infringed. Maybe there's an injunction and the storyline is that was a patent troll. Well, that's inconsistent with my understanding of what a patent troll is. Look, if it's not invalid, if their patent's valid, if it's infringed, they're not a patent troll. They, they have a property right, they're asserting it, that's, that's the whole purpose of our system. I wouldn't call them a patent troll, but that's the rhetoric. Uh, so you use the, the, the term non-practicing entity, I think is the more neutral term. I think the, the concern is really patent trolls in the sense, the true sense of the word. If the patent's likely invalid, if it's likely not infringed, if they're trying to file lawsuits to negotiate settlements that below cost of defense, that's a real problem and we should address that. But the problem, the, the problem is not non-practicing entities. And in fact, uh, the, the way of the world, especially since the industrial revolution, is specialization. Right? And specialization, Thomas Edison specialized in inventing. Not very good at bringing products to market, as it turns out. Uh, Apple's really good at bringing products to market, really good at marketing. They have great distribution, great manufacturing. They deserve to make profits based on that expertise. But if they didn't invent the technology, the person who specialized in inventing, they should, based on our patent system, get a share of the money that Apple's making a share. The, the beauty of the patent system, I think, and many things that are beautiful about the patent system, but this idea of a reasonable royalty, it's a beautiful thing. Um, if, you don't if, you, if you're not bringing your product to market, you don't get lost profits. You don't get the, re the return on the risky uh, development and marketing. You don't get that, you know, the, the, the company that actually brought the product to market took risk beyond the, the risk of creating the invention or, or devising or or conceiving of the invention, they took a risk in the distribution and the marketing. They spent a lot of money. They deserve a return on that investment. It's the beauty of the reasonable royalty. If reasonable royalties are calculated correctly, and that's a huge dispute, the reasonable royalty is not, um, that inventor is not taking that portion of the return on the investment that the practicing entity earned. Thank you. Uh, let me just check in with conference uh, organizers here. Do we, can we go uh, over time for another question? Okay, well, we, we, our, our last question, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is John Fraser. I've spent my entire career uh, working with uh, academics to help them transfer their technology into the marketplace, always uh, through tech transfer in partnership with corporations. And um, I want to make a, a, a comment that I've, I've seen the patent system uh, weak uh, prior to President Reagan coming into power, who then decided that patents were a tangible property. It could be strengthened. It got strengthened again. Now it's weakened again. And my, my comment is this. The CHIPS Act is going to, if it gets financed, put uh, double the budget behind university research. These are the people that are facing and addressing real issues that are patentable. Long-term uh, chronic disease, they're trying to save lives, medical devices and everything else. That, their budget may well double. And I guess my comment is simply this, unless we act as you, the chair, are suggesting to make sure that the process of getting things from inventors into the marketplace and allowing competition, uh, we're going to be forcing stuff into the pipeline that's going to be choked and, and, and not getting anywhere. The reason I'm concerned about this is I visited China many times in my career, and I can tell you they are laughing up their sleeve at what is happening in this country right now 
with respect to patents, okay? Um, they're, they're just hoping we continue to do what we're doing because they intend to eat our lunch. That's part of their written policy by the Communist Party. And if they do, they've also demonstrated what happens when they're in control, okay? They have demonstrated that they will force nations to their knees and unless America is able to get in there and compete and show the proper way where we're, academics are the ones who will receive the money to solve the real problems, which is the patent areas that you've addressed as well as the long-term issues of climate control. We gotta address that and it's gotta be people in the academic and other places that can do this. So it's a comment simply to reinforce what you've been talking about, which is the system, we cannot allow it to degrade farther. Thank you very much. I cannot think of a better way to conclude this panel. We will conclude it with that comment. And I would like to invite you to give a round of applause to our panelists. Everything in moderation, and thank you to our moderator, too. Mm -hmm.